I think it's appropriate to begin with a few words of wisdom. I'd like to quote from the eminent American philosopher who said, alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems, end quote. That is the, the great philosopher Homer Simpson, a, a, a notorious drunkard. Anyway, my name is Michael Landis, and I'd like to welcome you all to uh, another installment of Experts Next Door. Uh, I uh, am a trustee at the Saratoga County History Center. And uh, one of the privileges of being a trustee is working with uh, great folks and putting together programs like this. Just for, the, for those of you who don't know, the Saratoga County History Center is located in Balsam Spa at the uh, Brookside Museum. And we provide a variety of Please pardon my dog, who's very excited about this. If you hear dogs, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yes, please. sorry about that. We provide a variety of virtual events just like this. Um, and soon we'll be able to reopen our doors where we have all kinds of exciting exhibits and public programming planned, uh, hopefully for this summer. We'll, we'll keep you updated about that. Please uh, check our website. Please follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Uh, we post all kinds of stuff about everything we're working on, so please keep updated. And uh, I also want to thank you off the bat for your support. Uh, the, the money that, that we get from, from you all uh, pays for events just like this. It pays for the upkeep of the museum. The, the building is from 1792, so it's not cheap to maintain. We've got all kinds of exhibits in the works, uh, lots of great stuff. So Thank you in advance for your support of the, the History Center and the museum. Uh, tonight's uh, episode of Experts Next Door takes us into the world of craft cocktails and uh, Saratoga history. Uh, experts Next Door series, by the way, is a monthly uh, series wherein experts from all kinds of topics, from gardeners to brewmasters to mixologists to historians to published authors, I don't even know. We, if, if someone's an expert in something, we, we try to rope them in and bring them uh, to talk to us about whatever they're working on. So tonight, uh, we go just down the road to Saratoga Springs to the hottest restaurant and bar uh, in the entire area, Hamlet and Ghost. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Brendan Dillon, who's a co-owner. He's a native Saratogian. He's a bartender celebrity and all-around great guy, and he's going to Take it from here. Brendan, thank you. Hi guys, how you doing tonight? Uh, thank you so much for joining us, coming out, and, uh, coming out or staying in, whatever, <laughs> whatever you want to call this these days. But uh, yeah, we're really happy to be here. We're so glad they, uh, you guys reached out to us to, to do this. Um, we haven't done too many Zoom classes. We haven't done any this pandemic. This is our first one. You guys are our first cocktails Zoom class for, for Hamlet Go. So uh, yeah, we spent a little time getting things together, planning some fun stuff for you all. Uh, I will say I had my wisdom teeth out on Monday. So Victoria here has done a lot of the heavy lifting and kind of planned out, uh, you know, what to talk about with the history of cocktails, uh, where we started, where we are now, what we do at Hamlet and Ghost. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really excited. Uh, I know Michael wanted to tell me, uh, wanted to tell you guys a little bit about the history of the building. Uh, I, I only know so much. Uh, the building was built in the late 1800s. Uh, was originally a feed and grain and supply store. I almost called Hamlet and Ghost feed and grain, but I was talking to Hamlet and Ghost, obviously. <laughs> um, it was a, a livery and a stable for a while. It was then owned by two brothers who did a saloon and had a little bit of illicit gambling in the back room. Uh, and then later on, and I think most of its life, it was a, a plumbing supply store. Uh, it was that way for a long time. I, you know, I, as far as I could tell, going through some old books at the, at the library, uh, probably starting in the 19, late 1920s, I believe it, it turned into a plumbing supply store. And uh, right up until a couple of years before we bought it, it was still going strong and it, it was the same thing. So that was, uh, it was, it was really exciting to get into a cool old building that really hadn't been renovated. Uh, you know, a ton of time. So I think so often in Saratoga, you'll find a space, especially on this street, Caroline Street, it's been renovated 20 times or 10 times at least. So they've, they've torn a lot out, 
it, it doesn't really resemble its original structure or its original you know form very much and that was one really exciting thing about Hemlock Ghost it was it was there you know tin ceilings that had been in there for a hundred years it was the brick that had been there for a hundred years it was uh, a bunch of crazy things in the basement that had been there for a hundred years. The basement is crazy looking. Yeah, the basement is crazy looking. Uh, but it was really fun to play off some of those items, right? So we have these kind of um, black iron pipe uh, fixtures on the back bar that hold all our bottles. And those are, you know, just, those are just a nod to what's been there for the last hundred years. And I think we, we really didn't want to cover up what was there. We really wanted to just accentuate what had been there, keep a little bit of the history, touch up what needed to be touched up, but make sure that it felt like a space that had been grounded and had been there for a long time. Um, cocktails has such an amazing history of its own. I think, you know, for us, it was making it feel like Hamlet could have been there for a hundred years. And, you know, I don't know if we got all the way there, but sometimes I feel like we did a, a half decent job with that. So um, I'm gonna let Victoria take over for a little bit. She's gonna talk a little bit more about the history of cocktails, what we have for you guys. And I'll jump back in when we start making cocktails yeah. and I'll help out a little bit. I'll help answer questions for anybody who's got questions at home yeah. and we will go from there. Uh, thank you for having us. Hi guys, I'm Victoria. I'm a bartender at Hamlet & Ghost. So what I'm basically, basically going to do is I'm going to go through um, five different sections of cocktail history. We have the pre-dawn of the cocktail from before 1800. We have the dawn of the cocktail from 1800 to 1860. We have the golden age from 1860 to 1920. And then we have prohibition and the rebirth of the cocktail. I'm kind of going to go, I'm going to chop it up a little bit so it doesn't get, you know, kind of boring with all the history and then make the cocktail. I'm going to go through the golden age. And then we're going to make the cocktail and I'll finish up with prohibition and the rebirth of the cocktail. So mixed drinks have been around uh, for centuries. So, and it's quite possible that the world's first mixed drinks were created in order to mask the bad flavors of the spirit. Archaeologists evidence shows ancient Egyptians used dates and other fruits to flavor their beer. Romans drank wine mixed with honey, herbs, and spices. Taverns in New England were serving beverages like the sack posset, we have a posset on the menu. Yeah. That's where that comes from. Um, which was a mixture of ale, sherry, eggs, cream, sugar, and spices. Um, it's important to remember that during the 1700s, alcohol wasn't just viewed as something that's social, but something that was medicinal for a lot of people. But on May 13th, 1806, the editor of Balance and Columbian Repository, which was a newspaper serving um, Hudson, New York, they were in camp of the Federalist Party, and when uh, Thomas Jefferson was president, they wrote an article about a nearby Claverack uh, candidate, and they had written the Democrat had used up the town's stock of alcohol in a frenzy of boozy vote buying, um, stating the candidate's tab covered 720 rom grubs, 17 dozen brandies, 32 gin slings, uh, 411 glasses of bitters and 25 dozen cocktails. A reader later questioned this phrase cocktail and the editor answered, a stimulating liquor composed of any sort of spirit, water, sugar, and bitters. And I thought this was just like a really funny tidbit that the editor also wrote. It is also said to be of great use to the democratic candidate because a person having swallowed a glass of it is ready to swallow anything else. Um, David Wondrich, who is a really well-known cocktail historian, credits upstate New York a number of times for the possibility of the birth of the, the cocktail. And he says, if we follow the evidence, we can find it, the origin between the Hudson Valley, Connecticut, or Massachusetts. And I just want to reference a really wonderful book that I got to read recently, which is um, Spirits of Upstate New York by Don Casantry, and it has so much history in here uh, from Hudson Valley to Rochester to more up north, and there's so many th things in here that I can't even get to because there's so many detailed stories, and I would really check it out if you get a chance. 
Um, so like most cocktail history, there's a lot of folklore attached to it, which makes it kind of fun and mythical. So I'm kind of go over some of the the cock the tales of the cocktail where that term may have originated from. So the English cocktail in the middle 1800s referenced to a woman of easy virtue who was considered desirable but impure. And this was an attempt for uh, the English to stab at the Americans for tainting their good British gin from, with ice or with spices. Um, another popular tale, um, a tavern keeper named Betsy Flanagan, who in 1779 served French soldiers garnished with a feather and the soldiers toasting vive le cocktail. Flanagan was a fictionary character, a fiction character, so that can't be true. Uh, then we have Antoine Pichaud, who was a French refugee who settled in New Orleans in 1793 and opened an apothecary. Uh, he had made his own bitters. He had made his own bitters uh, called Pichauds, and we use them today in the bar. It's like an anise flavored uh, bitter. And it's used in one of the most popular co classic cocktails called the Sazerac, which originated in uh, New Orleans. And then uh, with that, he made a stomach remedy called an egg cup, a vessel called the, excuse my pronunciation, hooktier. Um, and they were saying that people that didn't speak French pronounced it like cocktail, but the apothecary didn't open until 1838. So that theory is also out. What people say really happened, according to David Londrich, who I mentioned before, is the term may have involved horses and their tails. So cocktail was a mixture of ginger and cayenne that they would put up the horse's butts to make their tail cock if they weren't having any energy. And I trust David Londrich as most bartenders would with history. So I wanted to kind of go back to the pre-dawn of the cocktail because the history of cocktails is kind of like a puzzle piece. So they all intertwine with one another. And there's something really special about um, the relationship of New England and the rum industry, and particularly Albany, which I found out, which is awesome. Um, rum is not only important in the context of New England, but rum is important in the cocktail that we're going to be going over that we're making together, the French 75, because the template of the French 75 is a template made from the Tom Collins which is a template made from the daiquiri template. So it's like a family tree, and we'll go over that in a little bit. But as everyone knows, the triangular trade had a huge part in rum. Uh, in the 18th century, New England became one of the leading rum producers in the world. It was, it was the colony's only commodity that could be produced in large quantities by non-English powers and sold to the English. In the fresh, French West Indies had a large supply of molasses, at this time, but the area was lacking in lumber, cheese, and flour, and these products were the main exports of the North American colonies. It led to a very strong business relationship. So rum distilled in the American colonies was shipped to West Africa, and they were traded for slaves. The slaves were brought to the sugarcane fields. They were forced to make, uh, to grow the sugarcane. The molasses from the sugarcane was then exported back to New England to be distilled into rum. New York was home to 17 rum distillers by 1750. And in the winter of 2000, an archaeological excavation took place after a building of a parking garage in downtown Albany under, uh, discovered a piece of historical history called Quackenbush Square, which now stands Albany Distillery, if none of you have ever been there. Um, it's near Hudson River along the lane of Quackenbush Street and extended to Water Belief. Their remains were found of two rum distilleries that operated from the 1750s into the 1800s. And what were found were nine large fermentation vessels. Two of them are in the New York State Museum and other equipment. Um, they concluded that although Albany region had predominantly Dutch culture, um, they were giving away to British and American influence at the time. And in the Albany Gazette stated in 1790, that the typical wholesale cask size for the common rum was the hogshead or the barrel, which is um, both barrels are made from American white oak that are previously charred, but the hogshead's a little bit larger. I also read that they did sell this rum in vessels the size of a wine glass because the barrels are huge. So people were buying those barrels, I'm sure, because they were drinking a lot more than we do now. 
Um, and if you go to Albany Distilling Company, which is something really cool they do, they do follow this a very similar recipe influenced by the Quackenbush um, rum distillery. Um, I'm gonna now get into the golden age of the cocktail. And after I get through the golden age of the cocktail, then we're gonna start making the French 75 because it's only fitting as it's part of that era. So this is the period between the Civil War and Prohibition, the mid 1800s. Um, Jerry Thomas, who to most uh, people that love drinks or you know bartenders, they would say he's like the founding father of cocktails. He was born in 1832 and before the age of 30, he had already traveled to France and England to show off his pure silver bar equipment. Um, his travels brought him to South Carolina where he studied the Mint Julep, uh, El Dorado, the first gambling saloon in San Francisco, and then St. Louis where he created the Tom and Jerry. He has gone to many places, that's just a few to reference. Um, Thomas is famous for making bartending and entertainment. So his signature drink was the Blue Blazer, and I will never be able to do this, nor do I want to do this, but um, the cocktail he'd light on fire and pass back and forth between two glasses to create a blazing arch. And apparently he did this with two shoulders. I don't know if that's true, but anything for a good tip. Um, uh, this was a time when, going back to the triangle of trade, this was a time where um, the industrialization of America was shaping cocktails. So, you know, foreign ingredients were shaping the way people were eating and the way that they were drinking. So that, the, the new ingredients and then the entertainment value was like really bringing in the, the, co uh, the cocktail era. Um, so it's it really interesting. Uh, two cocktails uh, Jerry Thomas made that were set in Sar were based off of Saratoga was um, from his one of his books, 1887 book, How to Mix Drinks and the Bartender's Guide. The first was the Saratoga cocktail, which is really similar to the Manhattan. Two dashes of Angostura bitters, one pony, which is an ounce of brandy, one ounce of whiskey, and one ounce of vermouth. And then probably the more well-known one is the Saratoga Brace Up, which had an egg in it, which is considered like an eye opener at the time because a lot of people were drinking this they, supposedly before they went to uh, bet on the horses. It was sugar, angostura bitters, lime, absinthe, fresh egg, brandy, uh, seltzer water, it's crazy. Um, Gideon Putnam um, is credited to be helping put Saratoga as, you know, such a hot spot by building hotels, spas, casinos from the natural springs, gambling, and we know, we know that the relationship between gambling and alcohol is very strong, so it's not a big surprise that this became a hot spot. Wondrich actually said that this was the, the New York's northern uh, Hamptons, but with added gambling. Um, and with all of these factors in mind, this became a resort area for cocktails. Um, and a few notorious bars that were imprinted in the golden age of cocktails include the Waldorf Astoria. A lot of these bars are based in New York City, but they were all over the all over the country. Um, the Manhattan Club, which a lot of politicians uh, ventured off to, but they also, yes, they drink Manhattans. Interestingly though, the Hoffman House Hotel in Manhattan was supposedly the birthplace of the Manhattan. We have the Knickerbocker Hotel, we have the old Absinthe Hotel in New Orleans as well. So I'm gonna, cut into making the French 75. And actually, you know what? I'm gonna go over the history of the French 75 again. Another fun tale of folklore for you guys. It's hard to, you know, take some of these stories seriously, but that's what makes it so fun. I mean, it's alcohol, it shouldn't be taken too seriously. Um, so for the history of the French 75, supposedly, the French 75 was first concocted by English soldiers fighting in France during the First World War. They took only the few raw ingredients they had on hand. So champagne, lemon, sugar, and gin. This is really unlikely that they had all of those on hand. Um, but in 1919, uh, Harry McCone published the ABC of Mixing Drinks. And inside he listed a recipe for a drink called French 75, created by a bartender named McGarry a Bucks Club in London. Uh, the drink was identical to a, com a Tom Collins, so gin, lemon, sugar, and soda. Which brings me to a really no another interesting point is that this is all about interpretation of what fits 
your preference. And some say that the, the French 75 wasn't meant to be served in a flute. It was meant to be served like a Tom Collins with um, a Collins glass with ice and some uh, champagne on top. So if that's what you want to do, then you should do it that way. Um, do we want to unmute everyone if they want to ask questions while I'm making the cocktails? Why don't you take some questions from Michael? He can ask some questions about yeah. the bar and just like cocktail so you can think that people may be interested in. And then we'll, after that, we'll hop and start making some cocktails and some more questions. Yeah, sure. Can Michael hear me? Is Michael there? Michael, you out there? there yeah, is. no, I'm here. I'm here the whole time. What did you say, Brendan? I just want to make sure I. Well, what I was saying is, you know, if you had some questions for us about, uh, you know, you might have some ideas for what people might be able to pick our brains about. But if you have some questions about, you know, what we do at Hamlet or um, a little bit of cocktail history, happy to answer some things before we get into uh, making cocktails. Well, I had some questions that are fairly pedestrian. If you uh, like, I'm just curious. I, I'm relatively new to the area. Uh, what are are Saratogians uh, interested in? Uh, do they still drink the historic drinks, or you guys find yourselves having to create um, new concoctions regularly to uh, appeal to the the palates of the locals? I think it's I think it's a fine mixture of both. I wouldn't ever came into Hamlet and asked me for a Saratoga brace up, but people have definitely come to enjoy classic cocktails. Um, it's again, it's a mix. You know, there's a lot of tourism that goes on here. Some people come into our bar and they don't really understand what uh, craft cocktails are, but for me, that's exciting to, to introduce them to them. Um, it's really all about people coming in and just being open to trusting what we do, which is provide high quality hospitality and a unique experience. So it's just, it's a mixed bag of different kinds of people, but you'd be surprised how many people that come in and are fancy drinkers, I'd say. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, look, some of the most popular cocktails now, I mean, this is probably the best time for craft cocktails in, you know, 20 years, uh, if not more, probably 30 or 40 years. So I think now more than ever, people are drinking things that are as classic as can be, right? The Sazerac, um, the Manhattan, uh, the old fashioned, the, what am I French 75. French 75. <laughs> um, so like, you know, those are still part of modern bar staples. You get into some of the, like there, I, I consider them some secondary ones. Like one of my favorite, two of my favorite cocktails I'll give you, um, are the Lucre. Uh, I love New Orleans cocktails. I love New Orleans. Uh, but the New Orleans cocktail, uh, options are, are awesome. And there's so many I mean, Sazerac's part of that, but I just love Lucre. I also always push people on a Corp Survivor, which is kind of a precursor to the Cosmo. And I think it's uh, a, just a really great, you know, citrusy, and everybody really always enjoys it. I can, if somebody's had a Cosmo to start, which I know they probably haven't, you know, had a lot of, you know, cocktails outside of that, it's a good one to go to second. So we can always give people another option and give them something a little, a little bit more historic. Uh, and just introduce them to something new. And then sometimes from that, we can get them drinking, you know, a lot of different things and, and trying things they haven't had before. It's just like, it's just a journey of tweaking every drink to like guide them on a path that's yeah. choosing something different. You know what I mean? Every time that they come in or the next drink. Do, do you guys see any patterns? Is there anything that like keeps coming up that, I mean, you're, you're on the other side of the bar. To us, we're just, we're just ordering drinks, but do you guys see anything that, that like amusing or interesting about Saratoga drinkers? We see plenty of that's amusing <laughs> Saratoga drinkers. Uh, I don't know how many of those stories we can tell here, but I mean, you know, I think as far as people ordering drinks, it's, you know, every once in a while, you know, we'll get, uh, we might get like the cocktail geek who clearly knows more about cocktails than we do, you know, from like, like, either, either a historical standpoint or, you know, like we, we love cocktails, but you know, we're, I, I haven't read every classic cocktail book. I, I you know, bits and pieces, and, I, and I've read a lot to get where I am, but, but every time, sometimes I'll meet sometimes, you know, more of a cocktail historian, you know, a guy like David Wondrich or somebody who's just really, really, really into the history, and it's always like, okay, you know, let's, you give me a classic recipe, you give me something crazy, let's make it, let's like, let's try something new, let's figure out, yeah, I'm, I'm always game to learn about a new cocktail. So I think as long as they come at it from a good perspective, we can always find something fun to kind of riff on or, or play on. Um, a lot of old fashioned, I 
fashions. People love old fashions in this town, in my opinion. Mm. Super popular, which is great. It's my favorite classic cocktail. It's like the OG of cocktails. Yeah. It's just bitters, sugar, and spirit. I think one thing we've seen less of that is kind of nice is we've seen less of the vodka soda. Yeah. Less of the, you know, some of the drinks that I just don't think have a lot to offer. So, you know, it, it, I definitely see people drinking more gin, mm -hmm. more whiskey, less vodka. We've never put vodka in the forefront, so that's partially just our bar. But um, because we don't put it in the forefront, I think two people tend to branch out a little bit and really try uh, something kind of new and unique. Yeah, I think it was hard in the beginning, right? Like when like establishing what exactly Hamlet was, but I feel like as time has gone on, people come in knowing what our identity is and they're up for that experience. We built trust too. Yeah. I, think, I think so much of being behind the bar as a bartender is building trust. Mm -hmm. um, so like as people get to know that you have their best intentions in mind and we're not just trying to sell them a drink. Yeah. Uh, you know, as people get to know that we have their best intentions in mind as they've come and had a few good experiences, then it becomes easier to recommend things, get people to try something they haven't had before, and ultimately, you know, start a more open dialogue. So, so would you say it's okay for people tonight, um, say if they, sh they they go to your, your place, to Hamlet and Ghost, is it okay for them to say, hey, uh, I don't know anything about cocktails, but I'd like, I like gin, can you whip me up something exciting? I mean, is that okay to just put yourself into the bartender's hands and say, do what you gotta do? Is that, is that like stressful for you guys or do you love it? Well, it, it would only be stressful if I'm like in the weeds, but I'll still do it because I, I again, my favorite kind of customers are the people that are willing to experiment with you. And I just think that's just more exciting. And that gives me the chance to, you know, play with different flavor profiles because this like journey of learning how to make cocktails is never ending. It's I'm constantly learning things. Brendan's constantly learning things. It's you're never just quote unquote an expert at making them. It's there's so many factors that go into it. So it's a, you know, it's a challenge for me to like make something for someone that they're going to enjoy. And I think that's a great part of hospitality. And I think now more than ever, the information is out there too. You know, for someone who gets excited about cocktails, there's, there's just a world of information out there. Uh, a good starting point would be a website called Punch Drink. Uh, I know I, I really trust the recipes there. I always find that the recipes there are really well researched and solid. Not so much for, from a historical standpoint, but from as far as high quality cocktails that come out really well. And I think, you know, uh, it's really fun now. There's certain things you can do at home that I don't think really exist before, right? It's really fun. Uh, we have this thing called barrel aged cocktails, right? right? So you can take you could take a gin drink. Uh, you get either you can buy these little spiral oak staves that people use for wine making, or you can get a little barrel. You can buy them online, but you can put you know maybe two liters of a cocktail in there, let it age at your house, try it every month, and see where that goes, and get something totally new and exciting. Another place I think that's really fun for experimenting at home, at home is uh, these kind of like pre-batch martinis. So you could take a wine bottle, you batch it out with in ratio. So like one part uh, vermouth to two parts gin, a couple dashes of bitters, maybe you throw something aromatic or something a little funky in there. And you can just keep that in your freezer. It gets better, it gets more interesting. You can sip on it later. Uh, you can always look up three batch martinis. Punch Drink has a couple couple articles this about it. This is a great book. Well, this is a great book. The Cocktail Codex, if you're looking to learn how to make a cocktail at home. This yeah. is very good. We've got a couple of uh, questions in the comments section. Uh, one of them says, uh, could you please go over two Saratoga original cocktails? I think so, you mentioned earlier there's a couple that were original to the area. The, yes, the Braso. I'm going to go over those two. Is that okay? Yeah, go for yeah, it. Yeah, okay. So the first one was a Manhattan style cocktail. Um, and what you'll see if you, if you look back in history books of like uh, classic cocktails, pre prohibition cocktails, is there's a lot of repetition that takes place, which is honestly really smart. I mean, these were the father of cocktail making, but they were really ahead of their time in terms of creating formulas because they were just making small tweaks, which is what I'm going to show you when we make the French 75. So uh, we have the Saratoga cocktail, which is very much like a Manhattan. So it was two dashes of Angostura bitters, which is a bitter from um, 
Trinidad, which has like a lot of cinnamon and clove flavor. It had an ounce of brandy, so cognac, grappa, could have been anything. Um, an ounce of whiskey and an ounce of vermouth. So it's basically a Manhattan. A Manhattan now is two ounces of bourbon and rye and one ounce of vermouth. So they just split it into two parts, brandy and uh, whiskey. And then the second one, which I think is the more popular one, is the Saratoga Brisa. No one has ever asked me to make this cocktail. It, it has a lot of different ingredients in it. Um, it's the tablespoon of fine white sugar, two dashes, again, of the Angostura bitters from Trinidad, four dashes of lemon or lime, two dashes of absinthe, one egg, um, a wine glass of brandy, shake up and fill up with seltzer. So it's, it's a spritz. Yeah, it's almost a flip or like yeah. A, oh yeah, it's a flip. Yeah, uh, and just to give you a kind of a modern twist, something that I saw that uh, I thought was really neat. There's a guy Dave Arnold who's a big, uh, he's big on the kind of scientific cocktail side, so he's doing always doing stuff with liquid nitrogen and carbonation. Uh, he did a riff at his bar, sadly shuttered due to the pandemic, but uh, at his bar in New York City called Existing Conditions, he called it the Saratoga Paloma. And what they were doing, which I think is just awesome, is they were coming up to Saratoga, they were kegging the water from Polaris Spring, which is, of all the springs, it's the highest salinity water uh, we have in the spring water in Saratoga. They would bring it back to the Lower East Side, and they did a riff on a, on a Paloma cocktail. So Paloma is traditionally uh, grapefruit and tequila, um, and it usually has a little bit of salt on the rim to give it a saltiness. So, in this kind of exciting way, they would bring the Polaris water, which already has this like very depth, like very interesting, deep, minerally salty flavor. Yeah. They would bring that back, force carbonate everything in their system with, um, with the tequila and clarified grapefruit juice. And you got this really exciting modern riff on like kind of a, uh, that's something, something that was uniquely Saratoga, but also of another place too, which is, you know, you know, Mexico and the South. I just wanted to let everyone know, according to the Saratoga, uh, this New York history book, um, the Saratoga cocktail, you can get it as made at the Saratoga racetrack. So they do a riff on it. It seems like a lot of booze. One half ounce of cognac, um, half an ounce of sweet vermouth, and one and a half, one and a half ounces of rye whiskey with Angostura bitter. So they made up you their- You can go to the Saratoga racetrack and get pretty messed up. <laughs> they doubled the cocktail. <laughs> and I'm sure, have you guys all, has everybody heard of the Saratoga Sunrise? I mean, we can't leave out the Saratoga Sunrise, uh, which is just basically a- Captain Morgan. What do they call Oh, they say Captain Morgan? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so white rum, Captain Morgan, orange juice, pineapple, and then it gets a little float of grenadine on top. Uh, they asked me to do a riff on this drink, which I actually enjoyed doing uh, Saratoga Living the first year we were open, because I hate that drink, <laughs> and it's terrible. But it is like, I could see it's it's kind of approachable and fun summertime drink that you can like sit out on your patio and have. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there is, there is some fun stuff from Saratoga out there. I do know that there used to be a bar on Spring Street. I think that's Spring Street. Just on the, so you had the, at the corner of Congress Park, there was a hotel on that corner where the art center is. Um, there was a uh, pretty well-established cocktail bar that I think was, you came across a, uh, a raised bridge from the Congress Park side of the street. And it was in the building where, what's that, where like Posey Peddler was forever. Um, so I think it was called the Saratoga Club. I tried to find out some more information about it and what, uh, see if I could find any menus when I first opened Hamlet. I didn't have too much success. So if anybody, any of you historians out there uh, find some stuff for me, I would love to, I'd love to check it out. Okay, we got a couple more questions if you don't mind. Um, uh, one person asks about basil flavored simple syrup. Um, yeah. do, do, is this something do you guys recommend? How do you recommend using it or what's the deal with it? I guess the person wasn't specific. I would say you can, so the fine green, green herbs and the ones that are a little bit more delicate, I usually like modeling them because I think you get, uh, when you model them, you get a little bit more chlorophyll and you get, A, you get a really nice color. Uh, I think you get a nice grassiness and green flavor. Some, some people will do this different ways, right? You could always take basil. Um, one of the good ways to do it is take basil, blanch it, so it holds its color, and then add that to a blender with the simple syrup that's already cold, and you can blend it for a while. You'll keep all the beautiful color from the basil. 
you'll get a fresher flavor than cooking it in. So I wouldn't recommend cooking it in. I think you lose a lot of the freshness. Um, the color gets a little bit more muted and brown and it doesn't work out as well. But if you blanch the basil first into the cold simple syrup, blend it for a while in your blender and then either go through a coffee filter or a cheesecloth, you'll get a really vibrant green syrup uh, that's a lot of fun to mix with gin. Beautiful. Wow, I had no idea. Um, as someone else asks, uh, Dean asks, when someone is not familiar with craft cocktails and asks what they are, what do you tell them your definition is? That's Scholarly good, question. That's such a good question. Um, I would say like a craft cocktail is a cocktail that's made from um, like the freshest ingredients. So for Hamlet, all of our juices, pineapple, lemon, grapefruit, lime, everything is juiced in-house. Um, all of our syrups are made in-house. All of our, most of our spirits, if not all of them, all come from small distilleries. It's, it, that's also a really big part of Hamlet is, you know, craft distilleries, uh, allocating from, you know, small families like Oaxaca in Mexico or Cognac from Cognac in France. So I would say, yeah, it's a, it's a combination of all those things. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, I think what we try and stay away from it's not we we like bigger spirit producers as long as they make a good quality product and, and kind of stand by what they make but we really try to avoid um some of the big conglomerate uh spirits that you can tell are designed to hit a price point in a brand image mm -hmm. rather than than quality and i think that's always what will will turn us off um so I, you can make a craft cocktail with anything if you put a little loving care into it. Yeah. But, but, but it's good to start with high quality ingredients, just like a good restaurant. It's good to start with high quality ingredients. It's good to uh, measure, you know, not that a craft cocktail needs to be measured, but I will tell you if you want to be consistent, if you want to learn how to adjust your cocktails to really how you like them and really dial in things to, um, you know, find your balance, what you like for acidity, what you like for sugar, what you like for for how, how spirit driven you want the cocktail. It's really, really good to just buy a little tiny two ounce measuring cup and start to measure things because you will know, start to learn a lot more about what you like. Yeah, I would like to say that there's really no rules when it comes to cocktails except measuring because I, even if you had, like for, for bartending at home or you know throwing a party or something, even if you had, you know, there's tons of large companies that make pretty good quality liquor, even if you have like the bottom of the barrel liquor, I feel like if you measured correctly, you'd yeah. still come out with a good cocktail, regardless of what you're putting in it. Yeah. We're always looking for good value spirits and, you know, even for mixing at home, it's so much nicer to pay $17 for a bottle of, of whiskey than $45 for a bottle of whiskey, yeah. A, because we can drink more and uh, because we're, we're bartenders and not super wealthy. <laughs> But if you have the money to spend on the good stuff, please, by all means, do it. Speak for yourself. <laughs> does anyone else have, before we begin the, the demonstration stuff, does anyone else have questions they'd like to, you're welcome to raise your hand or or post it in the comment section. I don't want to monopolize the session here. I, say, I, say, I see all these turned off cameras. If you're going to be, you know, on your camera and making these cocktails with us, we'd love if you guys turned on yeah. your cameras and we can see some of the process and see what you're doing. We'd love to see what you're making for drinks. So who's that? There you there? Scott, you was ready Beautiful. and excited. So we're, we're happy we got you, Scott. Um, but yeah, if you if you got them, turn them on and we'll, we'll make these together. And we're going to start showing you like, we, we wanted to not go too technical, not how we would make things at the bar so uh you want to do this or you want to show what we brought in um yeah do you want to make the drink and i'll show what we brought in yeah sounds good i'll start okay. Let me... well, why don't we describe together so so we can okay and then okay so i'm going to go over the materials we're going to turn our uh oh, down. camera down, down just a little bit so you guys can see what we're doing a little bit better so we'll try and keep our faces in there but it's going to be a little bit more down on our farther down farther down there we that's go that's good Oh, and turn it so they can see these. Can I oh, see yeah, those? I got you. Well, you can put them in. in okay. front of you. These are our tools. So the first thing, or one of the things that you'll need is a jigger or a measuring device. So if you don't have a jigger, it's hard to say because shot glasses, not every shot glass is measured the same. But if, as a bartender, sometimes but actually, I, surprisingly, I don't always have, like, I didn't have stuff at home for a while, so I had to wing it. So even if you have, like, a measuring cup that has 
say it has two ounces on there. I know that the base spirit has two ounces. I know that the lemon is half, like one ounce or something like that. You can eyeball it. Yeah, I was gonna say at home, I surprisingly, even though I own a good cocktail bar, I most of the time I use this little travel Yeti mug uh, that's the coffee mug. Right. So I like this a lot because it's big, it's insulated, so my hands don't get cold when I'm making a drink. It's got this cool little magnetic stopper on top and it doubles as a strainer. I don't oh. even need to have a separate strainer. So as long as I'm not making too, something too fancy, I use this a lot. This is the classic Boston shaker, if you pick one of those up. However, this is a classic cocktail shaker. So it's two piece and- This is like one of those giveaways. Like you, yeah. you see like, anytime you see one of those uh, liquor store, it comes in like a box and it comes with like a little mixing shaker on the side. Those work great keep for, it. for, yeah. Keep it because although I don't like this apparatus, I like- um, The strainer. I like, well, I like to eat both of them, but for different parts. So yeah. this is sometimes what I would do. This is like a, a chili pepper. Yeah, this is like one of those pizza, yeah. <laughs> pizza house chili tupper shakers. And I was taking this part of it and I was doing that. And then I had a shaker. And then when I was done, I would and put the top back on. And then I had a strainer. <laughs> if I'm muddling things in, like we were talking about basil and herbs and fruit, it's always good to have a little bit more of a fine strainer. So this guy is just a little bit of a tea strainer from, uh, I think this was from Saratoga Tea and Honey, but they use this for if you're brewing loose leaf tea uh, instead of a tea bag, and I'll just pour my cocktail through there and that'll get rid of any say mint leaves, basil leaves, raspberry detritus, anything like that. So you can find anything, any sort of vessel in Again, just be creative. Yeah. So I know we put two recipes on there for you guys. I wanted to go through a little bit about what I like and why we gave you two recipes. Uh, one thing we love about this recipe is that it's just so uh, versatile. It can be tweaked and changed. It can be, you know, if you up the amount of ingredients, you can just have a nice sour. Uh, I love this drink. I always push people to try this drink with gin because it's my, or sorry, with cognac. I'm a cognac I lover. Say. I know. I always <laughs> like with cognac. I said gin by accident. Uh, but I just love this drink with cognac. Uh, a lot of people will have it with gin though, so we want to kind of have it both ways. You know, if you weren't in the cognac world yet, um, so depending on what people bought, you can do it both ways. And we wanted to show. We're going to show probably four, at least two, at least three cocktails, maybe four. Uh, we're going to show you what your options are for really like tweaking this at home and getting creative and getting the creative juices flowing. So I will show you guys, uh, I think Vic's going to get our, our sparkling wine. Uh, another thing I really liked about this cocktail is how flexible the ingredients are. Some cocktails are much more picky to what ingredients you use. And this one is really flexible. You can, you can do this on a super tight budget with you know, 50 ml bottles from the liquor store. You can buy, you know, cheap sparkling wine, I think it always still comes out good. Or you can get a little crazier and you can have a really nice, you know, at least a, I wouldn't go really nice champagne, but you can do a nice bottle of champagne, a little bit better cognac, a little bit nicer bottle of gin. And every time you do that, I think this drink's gonna just level up a little bit and get a little bit more special, which I, I like about it a lot. So we are gonna show you guys how, we use this, you wanna use this one? Yeah, Sorry. Just, just We're gonna go like the, the homemade way, um, not how we would do it in the bar. We can always go back later. We'll do one like this way. Yeah, and then we'll switch over to some of our bar tools from Hamlet and show you guys how we would do it in there. So we're gonna make, I'm gonna make the classic. I'm gonna make my favorite right now. Uh, I'm gonna make option number one on the sheet we, we sent you guys and show you how easy, just how easy it is to pull this drink off at home. So if you're following along, this is when you'll need your ingredients. You gotta have your simple syrup out. You gotta have your spirit, a little bit of ice, a lemon, and I don't think I put it on your sheet, but a peeler or a knife will get you by for the garnish. So we'll, uh, let me show you how this goes. So here, uh, the one thing I didn't show you on our tools is a juicer. At home, I just use a little plastic juicer. It's got a well underneath that catches the juice, a little separator to catch the pulp. For today, I'm gonna just show you in our little hand squeezer juicer. We use this at the bar sometimes. It's called a beehive juicer. And it opens like this and it squeezes like this. Uh, if you don't have that today, you can hand squeeze. You can use a little bit of a juicer. 
or you can just like stick a spoon in there. You only need a half ounce of juice, so it's like, it's not gonna be too complicated, you'll see. Or if you're um, in a big pinch, you can muddle. You can muddle, yes, they wanted to tell you you can muddle. So I'm gonna take our one lemon here. We're not gonna need the whole thing. We're gonna cut it into a piece. We'll set our other side piece aside. Um, this goes in kind of not always as intuitive as people think, but it <laughs> drops in, slice side down. It goes, we're gonna use our jigger. So into our jigger, top comes down on here. And the great thing about this juicer is it really gets all of the juice out for the lemon. And it's super, super fresh. And it smells amazing when you do it. Because you get all the oils from the- Or like press. going up in the yeah. air. You can't see it from here, but like, as you press it, it's like oils, just like- It's really nice. Dispersing into the atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet for you. <laughs> anyway. Okay. All right, so we've got a half ounce of lemon juice. We just took some of our simple syrup from the bar. I know if you made it at home, we always use a two to one simple syrup. It's a little less dilution. It, for us, it was just, I don't know, it's always worked well for us. We, we like the way the cocktails come out. I feel like because it's concentrated, because it's two parts sugar, one part water, you always get to use less of it. Yeah. And it, if it's equal parts water to sugar, it just becomes more watery. And then I feel like it kind of adds a watery texture. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we're gonna do cognac. We chose, this is something off the back bar, Pierre Ferrand, this is a great value cognac. Their cognacs go up in price and get amazing, but this is kind of one we choose for the bar. Uh, a little bit pricier than you need to go, but it is a really good value cognac, I would say. Yeah. And there are a lot of good value cognacs on the brand coming from um, small brandy houses in France that sell to the larger conglomerates like Hennessy, for instance. So they might bottle their own and sell it under their own brand name. Um, there are really good uh, deals to be found. More, you know, some really fine. I mean, Armagnac is amazing. The prices are much lower than Cognac, and you get some really, really high quality Armagnacs uh, for for cheap. A little sweeter. Yeah. Uh, all right, so in our shaker, that's it. That's the whole party. Cognac, lemon, simple syrup. Can we talk about balance? Do it. I'm you talk, talk about I'll balance. add ice. Okay, so like I said previously in my historical pamphlet, uh, was that um, the French 75 is a template from the Tom Collins, which is a template from the rum daiquiri. So the rum daiquiri is known to some as one of the five main classic cocktails. And so it's kind of like an umbrella of the sour family, spirit, sugar, citrus. And a really important thing about figuring out your preference of how you like any cocktail is what what is your, what ratio do you like from tartness to sweetness? So for the classic rum recipe, uh, the daiquiri recipe is equal parts sugar to um, citrus, which is just like the French 75. But if you're like tweaking it, again, small tweaks are really important in understanding the balance of a cocktail. So if you want it a little more tart, you bring up the, the lime or the lemon, whatever the citrus may be. A splash usually equals um, 0.25, a quarter. Or if you want it to be a little bit sweeter, you can bring up the, uh, the, the sugar, another 0.25. So it's all about balancing the cocktail and finding out what balance you like to small tweaks. Always address your drinks in quarter ounce increments, yes, I would say. Always. Like as we're making stuff for the bar, we're almost always saying, hey, add a quarter ounce of this or take away a quarter ounce, let's try it again. So that's usually how we approach balancing mm -hmm. out drinks, um, especially as you start to work with different liqueurs and different flavors. Some liqueurs will come, or come in at a little bit higher breaks, a little bit higher sugar con content, um, and you'll have to adjust for them as we kind of forge new drinks and, and make new ideas. Yeah, and just to be safe, you can always add, but you can't subtract. So if you're unsure about something- Start drier. Yeah, start drier. Start with less. Shake um, it up. Shake it up. So in my little Yeti travel mug, I closed my uh, my little drinking hole there. I, the only thing you have to watch out with this is you have to hold it on nice and tight. It doesn't uh, leak at all, but it you don't want the top to fly off. Yeah, it's not the same thing. As it. 15 um, seconds. 15 seconds. And, you know, I've heard a saying is you want to wake the drink up. You don't want to put it to sleep. So you're always going to shake with a little bit more force uh, than you you would think. Sometimes I one of my pet peeves of watching other bartenders when I go out to drink is they give it an old 
and then they're gone. And it just makes me very sad. So, uh, what we're looking for is we're looking to chill the drink really fast. We're looking to get just to the right dilution so that we don't over dilute or under dilute. We want to combine all those flavors so that she's got it. Kathy, you're doing a good it's job. It's Cynthia, it's Cynthia. Oh, Cynthia, you're doing a good job. I see you're trying to wrong. <laughs> so we want to make it up. We want to give it a good shake. And uh, if you're using something that's uninsulated, when it feels like just cold enough that you can't really feel like, you feel like you can't hold on to, to it anymore, that's when you're, you're done. Uh, if you're using something insulated, give it a hard 15 seconds and shake really well. I'm gonna show you how this goes. She says we're good. Also, I want to know with ice in terms of like yes. house ice to bar ice. Yes. Our ice, for instance. We're going to show you. This comes from a Hoshizaki ice machine. And it's a nice little ice cold one by one inch cube. Well, it was ice cold. It's a little. They uh, dilute a lot slower than house ice does. Yeah. So if you're using house ice, if you're using chipped or those half moons or anything that feels, feels a little bit on the smaller side, shake for less time. I should have told him that before. I should have. <laughs> You're right. Um, you know where this is great, where those like old school plastic uh, ice molds come in. Oh yeah. You know the one Get like off you, Amazon. Yeah, the one you find in your freezer when you when you move into a new house. Uh, those actually work really good over the automatic ice machine. So if you have one of those, use those cubes for your cocktails. Uh, you can also buy on on Amazon uh, bigger cubes, so you can buy. Tivoli makes some really nice molds that are either mm -hmm. one and a quarter by one and a quarter, and they go all the way up to about two inches by two inches to pour your drink over. And that's a really, really nice drinking experience at home. Let's get straining. Straining. I'm going to, I'll strain it through my little tea strainer. I don't think I need to. Usually I think if I was at home, I would just pour just like that. And that would work great. Just for, to demonstrate how to strain a cocktail properly. I'm gonna show you, we're gonna go through this little tea strainer. Uh, some people really like the little chips of ice in their martinis and things like that. We prefer to go for like silkier textures uh, and we kind of go away from that quality a little bit. So you'll see in my strainer, I don't know if I can show you, but you'll see there'll be like little pulp, but not even pulp, but just like ice chips. We like to strain those out so you get a really nice mouthfeel. So you'll see, this is what we got for the quantity out of the drink. We put it, uh, one, we put two ounces of spirit and mixers in, and we probably got out four ounces, probably double. So we're probably about 50% dilution on this drink, and that's usually what, what you're shooting for. Vic's gonna show you how to open a bottle of champagne. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, in open, opening a bottle of champagne, you gotta go slow. And you put your hands, oh, sorry, I never do that. <laughs> Put your hand on the top of the cork so it doesn't pop and pop you in the face. Yeah, so as you untwist that little cage, you always want to be, be keeping the thumb on top just so the cork doesn't pop out. Uh, I have seen it. I have experience it behind a bar. I have, I have accidentally that. covered some patrons in a nice spray of champagne in my younger, less wise years. So I like to go slow, slow as can be. Feel it loosening up. You don't want a loud pop. Instead, you want a fart. <laughs> <laughs> that is how Vic wanted to describe it. Uh, you want you want to just get the it's cork about to go. Oh, it's here about it goes. To go. That's what we want. We don't want a loud pop because it, if we have a loud pop, we're losing carbonation, and we want to keep all that beautiful hard-earned car carbonation in the bottle. Oh, I'm going to show you two different ways to do to garnish your drink here. Uh, you can do it with a little knife. And what you're gonna do is just take another lemon that you have or the one that you have. You can even do it with the other half if, if that's all you've got. But what you're gonna do is just take your knife, set it on a cutting board, unlike me, and you're just gonna cut off a nice little coin. Be, be gentle and be slow. Yeah. Because you'll cut yourself. So what I did, I'll show you. All I did was I just cut off a little coin like that and it's just that thick and that's all you need. And as long as you do it the right way, you'll get all the lemon essence and qualities you need. So what we do is we want to take that with the yellow side down, the outside of the lemon, and we just want to hold it just above the drink and squeeze it in half. And you'll see all this beautiful essential oil uh, come out. And then we take the same thing, not the white side, but the outside, and just run it around the edge of the glass. 
And now every time you sip, you're going to get a little bit of those lemon oils. I like to put some on the stem of the glass sometimes because the oils will get on your fingers. And then it's every time you're drinking, you're getting more of those oils. That's next level. Right? That's next level. I also want to say that garnishes, this is kind of another detour, but garnishes are so important because any sort of drink can be transformed by a lemon peel, an orange peel, a grapefruit peel. Those oils are so powerful in, in uh, changing the palate of the drink. If you made an old fashioned without an orange twist on it, it would taste nothing like an old fashioned in my opinion. Yeah. It, it would be like missing that like last little thing. And I feel like the lemon peel in the French 75 is that last little like touch. Every time I have this drink, I just remember how much I love it. It's as good as the first day I, I had a really well done one. And I think that it comes together in such a harmonious way. It's the epitome of what a good craft cocktail should be. Um, if you're ever in New Orleans, you have to stop by Armand's French 75 um, because you'll get the white tuxedos and a beautiful presentation. And it's a great room, great, great classic New Orleans room. Uh, it's such a nice place to, to drink this drink. Cheers. So did anybody have a mishap? Is anybody... I want to hear about the mishap. Does anybody need help here? Is, any, is this not working for anybody? If anybody has any questions right now, is the time to get on here and ask and let us know what you think. You can probably tilt that up for a second. Tilt it up. I have a quick question of clarification. Are you doing... The other recipe as well, or was this a switch out with the gin and the cognac? Um... This was option number one on the sheet. So we did one ounce of cognac. Or gin. It was, it was one or the other. Yeah, so you had a okay. choice. Uh, we left it open to you. You didn't need both. Uh, I've never tried it with both. It might work. Uh, but So I just did cognac, lemon, simple syrup, uh, and then the Prosecco. So that's kind of our, our, that's our, our classic, classic version. And we're gonna do a couple more riffs that you can do that you can follow along with us at home. Did anybody, did anybody out there buy the Saint Germain and doing the Saint Germain and gin instead? Yes, we have. We did too. Oh, there oh, yeah. it is. There, there, there she is. Hi, Katie. All right, so that's what we're gonna we're gonna jump into the next version. We're gonna do the gin and uh, St. Germain version, so yeah. you can see it. And then after that, we're gonna show you how easy this drink is to riff on. And one thing I love about this drink is you can use up little bits and pieces of fruits and, you know, bits that you have in your fridge that you wanna kind of make a cocktail on. So yeah. uh, my, my one that I always seem to have is raspberry. So uh, I didn't have raspberries today, we're gonna do a cherry version, but later on we'll show you, or we'll, we'll explain how you can do it with cherry. So Vic's gonna make the gin and elderflower one. Oh, I'm sorry, will you put it back down? Yeah, I got you. All right, we're gonna do a riff. And let's see here. Okay, so for this riff, I'm gonna use I'm gonna use my chili tin. So for this riff, if you're looking down at your sheet, we have um, one ounce of gin. Doesn't matter what kind of gin you have. We have the same um, half an ounce of lemon. But you're going to see that we brought down the sugar to one fourth of simple syrup, and then we have an ounce of Saint Germain added, and that's because Saint Germain is an elderflower liqueur, and usually liqueurs that are flavored usually have added sugar to them. So we brought it down, like we said earlier, a quarter. So bringing that down a quarter because we're already adding sugar with another ingredient. What is this shaker called? Do you remember? Uh, that's called a. It's a Japanese shaker, but you're right. It has a different name. This is my favorite. People don't really like this one. <laughs> yeah, so that's a Japanese jigger. It's kind of fun. Uh, you don't want to see it for home use just as often, but basically it is two cylinders with a kind of a middle piece. And in each side, there's a set of lines. So on that side, you get, if I remember correctly, a half ounce, wait. It's, two, it's two ounces. Two ounces at the top. Yeah, it's an ounce and a half. Lines? Oh, two ounces, ounce and a half and a half ounce, right? Yeah. On that side, on the big side. And then on the small side, you get one ounce, quarter ounce, and 0.75 ounces. Most and people, lines on the inside for it. Most people like this sugar because it's just one straight tunnel and it goes from a quarter of an ounce all the way up to two ounces. Yeah. Okay. So 
this doesn't probably really matter when you're at home, but this is the way that Brendan has trained me, trained me to make drinks. Um, you always start with the cheapest ingredients. So say you're at home and you mess up. mess up. You didn't waste any alcohol, or you can just shoot it and be like, it is what it is. Yeah. So I'm gonna do the one fourth of simple syrup. And then we have, oh, here's the yeah, so we just took a little, they were using our bottle down at the bar, so we just decanted it into a, a Hamlet and Ghost bottle. So half an ounce of St. Germain. So St. Germain, if anybody doesn't know, this is an elderflower liqueur. So they uh, pick elderflowers in the, height in the peak of the season, add it to a base of sugar, water, and um, neutral grain spirit. So it just has this really lovely floralness that matches well with gin. Gin always seems to pair well with floral aspects, you'll find some gins that are more floral driven, and then you'll find more some gins that are more ginger, uh, juniper driven. So this is a juniper forward gin, Tangray, very classic London dry gin is that style. Um, so I think that these, you know, I probably on one where on a drink where I started with, or if I knew I was going to use all the flour, I probably wouldn't pick a really floral gin. So Tangray 10 would be like a more floral version of, of Tangray. Uh, so instead like I, yeah, so instead I would instead I would go for that more junipery gin and let the elderflower kind of pair with that herbalness. Uh, if you go a very floral gin and then add the elderflower on top, you can send up to something that's a little potpourri-ish or a little bit too floral, I think. Other way. Oh, I haven't used this thing in a long time. <laughs> The nice thing is if you're making fish for dinner or something else, you just save those halves, squeeze them over the top when you're when you're done with your, your fish dish. Uh, <laughs> so random. Well, I'm just saying we're we're all about using everything, I know. right? So like this is instance where there's still plenty of good lemon juice in there. So don't don't, don't waste, waste it. it. Oh, wait, so I want to be clear. So we put the fish in the drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, making sure. It does not confuse. <laughs> If you're doing this version at home, I would shake it for 10 seconds. Instead. All right. Once you got the, the big cubes. Yeah, if you're using higher size, smaller cubes, 10 seconds. All right. We've got bigger cubes, so we're going to go a little bit longer. So slow. That was nice. <laughs> All right. Okay, and then I'm gonna go back to. Some of you people with uh, profile photos, I can't keep expecting you to move. But <laughs> That's you just, true. You just stay this way. I'm gonna go with the uh, chili shaker as my strainer. If I can get it on. No, I probably can't. It's too wide. Where it fits, right? It, it's gonna go all over. Oh yeah, I was wondering about that. <laughs> Well, we live and we win. Oh, yeah, that's true. My so, this would be our classic uh, at the bar we would use. Hawthorne strainer. Yeah, Hawthorne strainer uh, is here. This is a really good one. If you ever want cocktail tools for your home, Cocktail Kingdom is the place to get them. Cocktailkingdom.com. Or if you want a cheaper deal, Webstrong. <laughs> or Webstrong for cheaper stuff. Uh, or Amazon for cheaper stuff, honestly. But uh, Cocktail Kingdom does sell re reliably and high quality uh, uh, tools for making drinks at home. It has a nice selection of books. It's got all the fun, fancy glassware and picks you could ever want. Uh, so I do still like this stuff. I still buy these strainers for the bar. The difference from what you may get if you buy it at, say, Target or Home Goods is this spring that is on here. And if you can see it, it's a really nice, I'm gonna get a little closer. It is a really nice, high quality spring and if you notice see how close it is together a lot of times when you buy cheap strainers what you'll get is a much wider gap between all of these uh, spirals and this gap is great because it gives you more control over the drink more control about how much uh, pulp or de uh, detritus comes out and the whole thing's just made really well and works really nicely i didn't need it because i improvised she improvised two of these Say you have a Boston strainer or something like this at home, you can just put the little one inside the large vessel and then just 
create a very small lip opening so that way no ice comes out. This is that's like the old school high volume yeah. bartender trick. And then cross like a little. So I showed them with a knife how to make a yeah. She's gonna show you how to do it with the peel. We use the peel at Hamlet. I prefer the peel because personally I'm not very good at cutting the, um, the peels off of the lemon because I tend to get too much of the pith, which is the white, the, the white part of the lemon on the inside. And the pith is really bitter. So this guy. I personally like to use, like to go through each part of the, the lemon peel. So I do one side, the middle, and the other side. And then sometimes I just do an extra twist. A couple times and then it's all spunky. Such a good drink. Here, well, cheers. Ooh, it's good with the elderflower. Cheers. 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 Who made their drink? Who's enjoying it? Does everybody think this drink is worth the uh, worth the effort? I hope. <laughs> good. Good. It's good. Give us a thumbs up if you're enjoying it. Sweet. Love yes. that. Yeah, we love that. I also love it without the prosecco. Yeah. Because I really fun. like gin. Yeah. It's yeah. just delicious. So my my first one I had with the prosecco, but then the second one, you know why? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, like the daiquiri recipe. Yeah, and you should look up a bee's knees. A bee's knees is a, a really classic gin, honey, and lemon juice drink, oh, and it's it's very bee's, bee's knees. Knees, yeah. Hilarious. Okay. Uh, gin, lemon juice, honey. Uh, as classic again, as classic as can be. It was a it was a way during prohibition that people would cover up cheap gin uh, by adding sugar and and honey to it because that was you know everybody had sugar and honey for their tea. Uh, you would take bathtub gin, uh, add a little bit of honey on top, add a little bit of uh, lemon juice on top, excuse me, and you had a great cocktail. And we still make those, and we always rip on those at the bar. They're really uh, yeah. approachable and good. Now, we're going to show you how you can be your own bar star. Bar at home. star. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to show you a drink real quick. That one. So, we're going to take the base recipe for the uh in the meat flavor yes uh we're gonna take the base recipe so we're gonna use it i'm gonna do gin i was gonna i said i was gonna use cognac to, to vic but i'm gonna change that i have downstairs our chef is using a little bit of cherries they're just macerated cherries i'll get a little closer they're just cherries that were macerated she put a little bit of uh juice. Yeah, she did. yeah a little bit of juice and then cooked them down i will tell you when, I, when i'm at home 90 percent of the time i'm using up some blackberries some raspberries or what else? Hmm. Cherries, if I had them in season. I feel like those are the blueberries. main two. Yeah, blackberries and raspberries are like such such a good muddled fruit for, for drinks. Uh, so if I was at home and I had a couple extra cher uh, raspberries, I would muddle them the same way I'm going to do these cherries, and you'll see how this comes out. So I'm going to use Vix. Well, Here, use this, this awesome shaker. All right, perfect. So let's transfer this over here. I'm just gonna take, if I was at home, I would probably take three raspberries, maybe four. So I'm gonna take three cherries, a little bit of the syrup, and drop them in the bottom. And then uh, we improvise. This was a little mini meat cleaver, uh, meat pounder that we <laughs> had at our house. Usually we'd use a muddler. I do have a muddler at home, but a spoon will work. Any blunt ended object, the back of a spatula will, will work. So I'm gonna use this. We're gonna muddle these up a little bit just to get some out. Now, are you going to adjust the sugar because of Yeah, I think I'll go down a little bit. I think this is a time where you would only go down like a scant amount, to, so to say. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll start with that. I'm going to use the rest of your lemons that you didn't use. So there I'm going to put it in here. Again, we're using everything up. So I got about a quarter ounce out of the first lemon. That one's done. Let's see if I get another quarter ounce out of the other one. No, nope, not quite. I gotta cut another lemon. All right, so I've got my half ounce of lemon juice. Remember, we have a little bit of acidity in with the cherries, so if you know, I could probably even go a little bit less, but I think we'll be okay. Uh, for this one, I'm gonna go simple syrup. We'll drop down. So we like we when we're making drinks at the bar, a lot of times we'll reference a scant half ounce 
or a heavy half ounce if we think that that drink just needs a little bit of adjustment just of tweaking tweaking it down so i got my cap on there uh so on this one i'm going to go a scant half ounce instead of a full half ounce and then i'm going to add that and i think i'm going to make this one just a little touch boozier so i'm going to go an ounce and a quarter of gin Now we add our ice. I'm using my fingers. Usually I have a little pair of tongs. That's okay. We're doing it just for us. No big deal. Big side goes on the little side. We always put, it's a little hard. A lot of people tend to drop the, sh the shaker straight down. And you can do that, but what'll happen, it'll be harder to get off. So instead, you want to tilt it so you have one straight side and an angled side. So if you can see it like that, I have a straight side and an angled side. And I'll give that a nice hit so they're sealed. I turn it upside down. I put my fingers two on either side of the gap. And now I'm going to shake. And what we're left here is, if you can still see it, I have my straight side here. I'm actually going to turn it around. So now I have my straight side on this side. And what you want to do is you want to turn it so, let's see if you can see it. That lip is hard yeah. to open. Yeah, so I want to turn it so that it's perpendicular to that. And I just give it a little hit on the side, a little karate chop. If you don't get it on the first time, just go all around until you yeah. get it. So it'll be on pretty tight because you create a small vacuum in here, right? And it'll tighten up on you. And you give it a little crowded chop, you'll hear it click. And then usually you can slide the top right off. And the reason I said that this is a showstopper drink is because if you muddle a little blackberry or raspberry in there, you're going to get such a beautiful color. I'm going to do what's du called double strain. So I'm going to use this. I've got my hawthorn strainer on top. And I'm going to use my little tea strainer. And we're going to go right into the glass, make sure you can see it. And I want to show you what a beautiful color you get. Look at Katie's got it. Gorge. Beautiful, Katie. That's so nice. Now, before I even have my I just want to show you, if you serve this to your friends, they will be so excited. Because <laughs> how could you not be excited about this? Uh, take this out of the way. I'm going to add my Prosecco. And we're going to do, we're going to do a fancy lemon peel. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go from top to bottom. All the way around. Oh, not all the way around. Not all the way around. I'm going to take that, but I'm going to make it a little bit here. Instead of leaving it how it is, I'm just going to cut those raggedy sides off. And we'll have a nice, nice square. Beautiful peel. And if you can see it now, it's just nice and clean and it looks really pretty. And when you twist it, it looks really nice. And it's those small touches that really make the difference. Yeah. This is one of the kind of things you can do for yourself that honestly make quarantining at home with COVID feel a little bit more exciting. Yeah. So that, I just think, is so it's fun. So pretty. And so beautiful, and why this drink is so versatile and fun to make at home. I want to try that. Yo, so so good. What did you think? So, so, do you guys have final? Anyone in the audience have a, a final thoughts or questions? I see a lot of people have posted stuff in the chat. Now's your time to to jump in and and let us know who you are and post some questions. Floor is open, so to speak. Now that we're now that we're all uh, tipsy. Quick answers, Zoom questions. Zoom questions. No, no, you can stay over here. Okay. I'm gonna answer on chat. Okay, I, I can't see. Yeah, that's why you're gonna talk to people. Okay. Does so anyone have any questions? Yeah, looks like Nicole. I, I'm, I hope I'm saying your name right. Nicole says uh, or asks, how do you come up with your original cocktails and your menus? Oh, so this is that's a fun question. We're actually in the middle of doing. A spring cocktail right now which is it's all of the bartenders participating 
Um, so it's Brendan, myself, Sonia, and Jerry right now, who's a new bartender who used to be our bar back. He's so awesome and we're so proud of him. Um, so basically, it, usually it comes up with like a concept. And I think it's really important, like Brendan was explaining with, you know, the raspberries or the blackberries, seasonal ingredients. So we're always looking for, you know, spring flavors, spring herbs, um, anything like that. And then what usually happens, at least this is for me personally, I'm a really big fan of taking any sort of classic cocktail template and twisting it and making it my own. So again, let's say that I'm going for a daiquiri variation, which is two ounces of rum, um, three equal parts, uh, which would be three quarters sugar, three quarter lime. Say I wanted to do a spice pear daiquiri, which is an old cocktail from one of our menus. Um, I take that two ounce spirit I choose, you know, a certain rum depending on my flavor profile. So I've decided on a flavor profile and want to do pear. I know that um, a certain rum goes really well with pear. It's gonna, it's gonna pair perfectly. And then I'm gonna start tweaking the sugar, the balance between the sugar and the citrus. So I start tweaking like those little things. I found like a spice pear liqueur. I know that it's gonna have some, some of that residual sugar in there. So instead of doing three quarters of the sugar, maybe I'll do half an ounce of the spice pear liqueur, and then I'll start with two, uh, a quarter of the sugar. So it's kind of like that. Right now we've been working on spring cocktails. We're picking out our, our uh, flavor pairings that we really like. I just did one with um, tangerine and almond, and then I moved over to a template that would work for me. What have you to add to that? No, I think that's about right. I mean, I, I like to work from having an endpoint in mind. So as you get a little bit more comfortable with classic cocktails, I really like to think about things as, um, a Manhattan with these flavors, a sour with these flavors, a fizz with these flavors. Um, when I'm looking and searching for inspiration, it can be from dinner menus, it can be from desserts. I've seen desserts work really good for, for uh, cocktail inspiration, first of all. Uh, but also, um, I'll scan around cocktail menus, you know, from 10 different bars, and I really look for, I think, things that are flavor hooks. I really look for things that I think in my head sounds so good together or so so smart you know um not everything is always intuitive that's why it's good to look at like good pastry chefs and see what they're mixing together that might be a little unusual uh, but anytime i see a little hook two ingredients that are unexpected and exciting that's where i think i've really struck gold and found something that's going to be fun um you know I, i'm trying to think of something on our menu exactly but uh you know the ginger is that grapefruit liqueur and ginger and gin and this egg white foam is like a winner and, and it's going to be really exciting to people um but yeah that's that's why I, like, I love to look for little two two ingredient pairings that i think are going to be really fun and exciting for people and another fun thing about that is sometimes this idea that you have you it's good to not get too attached to the idea sometimes it just doesn't work out but sometimes it's fun to watch like the journey of the turn that it takes so i might be making trying to make a spice pear daiquiri but all of a sudden i'm making like a sidecar riff that has spice pear in it so kind of like accepting whatever direction it kind of takes you as part of the process yeah don't, yeah we go it's never, don't take it too personally you know if it doesn't work it doesn't work yeah sometimes we go too crazy and we realize we've gone out there into kind of no man's land a little <laughs> bit and we have to dial it back because uh, we'll look for really like kind of not we don't intentionally look for bizarre pairings but sometimes we do look for things that will end up being kind of contrasting and exciting and it's uh, led to some pretty serious disasters okay that's that serious <laughs> any more questions anyone this is the this is the last call so to speak for uh Question. Yeah, yeah please. A question about Hamlet, about cocktails. Um, you know. I did. Is, I did want to. Is there time for me to briefly go over just the rebirth of the cocktail really quick? Because I find it quite interesting. Is that okay with you, Michael? Five minutes. Five minutes. All right. I'm gonna go over the rebirth of the cocktail. So the rebirth it. of the cocktail is really interesting because it really happened in the late 1980s when there was this surge of, in the beginning of the 80s, there was this like crazy like health craze going on with like all the aerobics and everything, mm -hmm. which was another part of why after prohibition, it was so difficult for the resurgence of cocktails because there was all of these roadblocks along the way. So during this time, the term punk cocktails in dive bars really started popping up and a lot of dive bars actually 
um, were brought to life during Prohibition. A lot of people think Prohibition, a lot of cocktails were made then. They weren't made, uh, well, there were some made then, but most of them were made prior to Prohibition or they were made after Prohibition or during Prohibition in Europe. Yeah, I was gonna say other countries that didn't have Prohibition. Yes, that's, where in you, Europe. You, that's where you kept really great cocktail making going. Yeah. So it was really cool because the punk scene was like bringing out like the Long Island iced tea and Jello shots and like all these crazy, all these crazy things. But there was, there was a super cool resurgence because it showed people that we're having fun again drinking. And this was the time when Dale, when Dale DeGroff, who was working at a hotel in Beverly Hills, was revamping the cocktail scene. And I don't know for a fact if he had seen like this revolution of like punk cocktails, but I'm assuming maybe he saw something about it and saw, oh, this is fun. Let me like resurrect like the old, the old times, the good ones. So that's kind of like a historical fact that I think a lot of people misinterpret about prohibition and like the rebirth of the cocktail. So Del DeGroff started working um, in Beverly Hills. He, uh, the uh, the interweb actually had like a huge part in, oh. had a huge part in the reinsurgence of the cocktails. There was um, a blog called, hold on. You got it. No, it's not it. Oh, bar uh, I used to be on this. Bar boy or something. No, no, yeah. Uh, what was it called? I was on this in the beginning. I forget. It was. So sorry. Drink boy. Drink boy, yeah. Drink, yeah. Drink boy. boy forums. Drink boy forums. So think of Reddit, but just for cocktails. Yeah. So that's what was happening. People were like starting to, you know, spread information to one another. And then there was this. This huge um, the Cosmo. I think you're leaving out the Cosmo. I, I didn't do much information. Well, no, I, and I think the Cosmo was the Cosmo got so popular, and I think because of the way in the show that they they portrayed it as having like fresh lime juice and good quality Cointreau mm -hmm. in it, it I, I remember when I was beginning bartending that people would say to me like I want a Cosmo but I want fresh lime in it. I want Cointreau in it. Yeah. That was the first time in probably 20 years that people had asked for fresh ingredients, high quality cordials, and good good quality uh, yeah. vodka potentially. So I actually, I think the Cosmo was a big part of at least the segue into yeah. high quality co cocktails because I just remember people asking me for what would essentially turn out to be a really good high quality cocktail. Mm -hmm. Cosmo is a high quality cocktail made by a fantastic bartender. Um, it was being made poorly a lot. And yeah. I think it got so popular that people actually demanded that it be made cool. properly. That's so cool. And then lastly, um, in 2003, there was an event that took place at New York's Plaza Hotel and it brought so many different cocktail people into the scene and it uh, uh, attracted a lot of media. And uh, it, was a, uh, it was a huge success. And William I, I think a lot of where we're at with cocktails boils down to, you know, two or three bars in New York City that went in a whole new direction. You had um, Milk and Honey, which was kind of this oh, yeah. crafted, yeah. Uh, faux, speakeasy, yeah. uh, where people, you know, it had all these rules for drinking, it had all these, uh, you know, you couldn't order a Cosmo, you couldn't order a Lemon Drop Martini, you couldn't order a vodka soda. It was, they, you know, they had these kind of strict, and I think they needed to be that. At the time, they needed to be that. And it was, you're going to you're gonna drink the way we want you to drink, or you're not going to drink at all if you want to be here. And people really fell for that, and it became one of the most popular and hard-to-get spots in a bar in New York City. And from there, you had a couple of really fantastic bartenders who all seemed to uh, kick mm -hmm. it off at Namely, three bars, Milk and Honey, the Pegu Club, and, yeah. sorry, and, uh, sorry. Milk and Honey, the Pegu Club, and Death and Company. Uh, Who makes this book that we just spoke of? Yeah, and those were, those were the big three. Those were the people that were crushing it uh, in New York City. The, all the bartenders from all three of those bars at the beginning have gone on to be award-winning bartenders. Open their own places. Open their own places, spawn, you know, tons of bartenders that went out into the world and did great things and made it possible for us to do what we do. Uh, and, you know, we just love doing this. It's really fun. It's really fun to be behind the bar. Yeah. It's fast paced. It can be a little frantic, but you kind of get into this funky flow state where you're really kind of vibing with the people that are in yeah, front of you, it's a lot of fun. delivering the experience that they're looking for, whether it's learning about cocktails or enjoying a date night or yeah. how to, uh, you know, just have a little quiet evening by yourself. It's, it's really fun, fun being behind the stick. Um, and I think, 
you know, the whole goal behind Hamlet and Ghost was give, you know, give these guys, Vic and Sonia and Jerry and the people who kind of come before them, the tools to do anything behind the bar, right? You know, like I will, I will buy anything for the bar, anything that they're excited about, we'll get it so we can deliver fun experiences because I want them to be hooked and to be excited and to have something really exciting to tell the person in front of them. Uh, that's what that's all about, all what bartending is about is being a, you know, my dad would say, there's a bartender and there's a bartender, <laughs> you know, and, and, and we try and be both. We try and be, you know, good technical bartenders and we try and really feel the vibe that people are giving off to us and bounce that back and play off that. And when you can feel that that's working, I think that feels successful. And you can come in and you can order a vodka soda because everyone is welcome at Hamlin Ghost. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Really appreciate but, but, it. But Becky's been waiting patiently. Becky, do you have a question? Yeah, got back. Oh, I don't Just care. back to your um, fruits. I think you cooked down the cherries. But do you just model the blueberries and the raspberries? That's it, just model. You can go for different flavors. You could use, you know, if you wanted to go cooked fruits. You could do it. This is like wine, right? So when you talk about wine flavors, a lot of times people will talk about cooked fruit flavors or more uh, uh, stewed fruits or bright and fresh quality fruits, right? Sometimes wines have this really aromatic, fresh raspberry quality. Sometimes they have this more of a stewed fruit kind of quality. Uh, so you feel free, cook your raspberries down. It's not gonna hurt. Cook your blueberries down, it's not yeah. gonna hurt. It's going to give you a different flavor. You know, you're gonna either end up with something that's really fresh or, you know, if say I was gonna do cognac, I might cook the fruits down. Yeah, because, that'd be good. Yeah, because that stewed fruit quality will work really good with cognac. Yeah. Where with gin, you might want something a little bit on the more herbal, bright, grassy kind of side. And it's all about experimentation. So if you want to try something, just try it. And what's the hurt in trying it? And that's the way that you're really going to find out what you like. And that's just going to lead you more down another path with, you know, more interesting cocktails. So don't be afraid to do anything. Yeah, and we only got into citrusy cocktails. Yeah. But there's so many, so many stirred cocktails that you can make at home in the Manhattan family, the Negroni family, the Sazerac family. Um, so many people stirring Amaro into cocktails, Italian Amaro into cocktails these days. So it's endless. you can really, yeah, you can really, you know, my wife prefers, she doesn't do very citrusy cocktails. She really likes a boozy, mm -hmm. long, stirred kind of sipper, uh, even sometimes with some bitterness in it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you really have to look at the couple families, you know, fizzes, sours, uh, stirred. Family, look at those, take a little bit from everything from every family and see what side you want to explore a little bit more. Great. It's been a terrific evening. Thank you guys so, so much. And Jin Jin Fizz is all about, you know, Jin Jin Fizz. It's always <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions for us before we uh, wind down? Uh, Anne asks, I guess the last one, do you have any non-alcoholic beverage options for those who can't partake for medical reasons? Yes, of course we do. So we're actually working on a non-alcoholic portion of our menu right now, but Hamlet always has these options. Um, something really cool, there's been like a huge surge in non-alcoholic spirits and recently. Low ABV. Yeah, on, on, and low ABV on the market. And there's this really wonderful company that comes out of the UK called Seedlip. S-E-E-D-L-I-P, and they make spirits that are based off of, to me, they replicate gin, and they have like a bunch of different flavors. They have like Spice 94, all of these things. Um, if you don't have that, that's fine. It's it just, a, again, it's a matter of balancing those things. If you want to do it at home, balancing fruit and juices and, and syrups, but at Hamlet, we can make, I have so many people that ask, can I get the gin gin fizz without alcohol? And I just sub like, I sub uh, grapefruit juice or something like yeah. that. You know what I mean? Like we can sub those things out. And if you do go the route of the uh, non-alcoholic spirit, it makes it even more vast. If you search Amazon for low ABV cocktails, there's one big book in particular. I wish I could remember the title off the top of my head, but a really good quality book that's about, it's a mix of uh, zero 
you know, 0% cocktails. And then yeah. it's about half of it is low ABV. So all stuff that probably falls under 5% alcohol. Uh, so it depends on, you know, what you're, if you just can't high, have high proof or not. The other thing I was going to say is uh, was something cool we found on the, on the other day. Yeah, there's a, a site called Kegworks and they sell a couple of non-alcoholic spirits. Each one replicates either rum or whiskey or tequila. Um, cool. Yeah, and so we're going to get those, some of those and experiment with them. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely some, there's lots of, right now there's more options than there ever were for, for low ABV and NA cocktail drinkers. It sounds stupid, but the internet is your best friend. If you just Google the things that you're looking for, you will find a link to something. It'll send you down some route to find something that you're looking for, for a resource, for sure. Look at cocktail that will pay real quick. All right, any, any final, uh, anyone else? We don't want to cut off things too quickly here. But this uh, party has to end at some point. And as they say at the bar, you, you, you don't have to go home. Well, you're uh, already home. <laughs> this is the book you want from Amazon. It's called Session Cocktails. It's by also Drew Laser and the editors of Punch. And it's a really fantastic low proof and uh, zero ABV cocktail book. And I just want to let you guys know that, that you can always um, email Hamlet and Ghost or you can. <laughs> <laughs> or you can inst like Facebook message us, or you can Instagram message us with any questions ever, and we're we're happy to answer any questions for you in regards to like resources or anything like that. Yeah, punch drink cocktail kingdom. Those will be like I think if you started there for both tools and recipe ideas, yeah. you would find a world of stuff to to kind of rabbit hole down. Mike, I think you're, Mike, you're sorry. I'm just reminding people that you guys are in downtown Saratoga Springs, uh, perfectly located, right, right on the corner. Can't miss them. Beautiful historic building, uh, beautiful interior, great food too. I don't want anyone. We're not talking about food tonight, but holy moly, if you guys haven't been down to Hamlet and Ghost yet, um, it's the eats are just as good as the drinks. I can tell you from it's my favorite place in town, so I'm, I've got a personal interest in this. Um, just just for full disclosure there. Uh, so if you haven't been, I suggest you guys, uh, especially before track season, yeah, <laughs> get, get down there. Because okay, I think this summer is going to be crazy. <laughs> That's right. All right, anyone else? Any other final thoughts? Everyone good? All right. Well, on behalf of the Saratoga County History Center, please allow me to thank you for joining us tonight and to please check the check our website and our social media accounts. See, every, we have one of these every month all kinds of different topics and this this went very well tonight i would love to uh to have a uh, hamlet and ghost do something else perhaps in the future um if they're willing we'll we'll exploit their generosity anytime we any chance we get uh so yeah. thank you very much it was great thank you so much Thanks, guys. cheers thank cheers. you good night everyone <laughs> Bye, thank you bye-bye Yes. Hi. We did it. We did it. People are still on. <laughs>